Okie dokie, be quiet, kidlets, be quiet, hear ye, hear ye. Alright, so I want to apologize because the video I was working on won't be out for a while because I got burnt out making it, which usually doesn't happen, so I'll release it in maybe like a month or so if I feel like it. I don't know, so now we're here. Anyways, top 10 historical figures everyone should know but don't. These are people who have done pretty significant things, and for some odd reason aren't household names. Number 10 is F.W. de Klerk. So, de Klerk is famous for ending the apartheid regime in South Africa in 1994, which was this horribly racist mess of a system that was implemented in the country for many decades, where the white population, called Afrikaners, had access to the best and brightest utilities in the country, while the native black population was always being put down and segregated. It was like segregation in the United States, just worse. De Klerk was the last white leader of South Africa, and he dismantled apartheid there. Look, there's a picture of him with Hillary Clinton. Under him, Namibia also gained independence as a country very peacefully as well. Usually, Africa has had some trouble with that in history. Surprisingly, de Klerk is still kicking around today, although he is quite old. If you're watching this in the future after he dies, then this will be of no use to you. I don't think he gets enough credit for taking apart one of the most monstrous regimes a country has been led by, save for Zedong or the Nazis or something. The fact that this didn't end until the mid-1990s is shocking. Like, we had internet and video games, and South Africa was still under this racial segregation nonsense. I wonder if Rhodesia had the same problems. Probably. Number 9, Ptolemy the Fifteenth. Also known as Caesarion, Ptolemy the Fifteenth holds a title that everyone should know about, which is the last pharaoh of Egypt. When you think of pharaohs, you think of Cleopatra, Ramses, King Tut, etc. Ptolemy the Fifteenth was just as important because he served as the end of a 4,000 year reign over the Kingdom of Egypt. He ruled with his mother Cleopatra from the year 44 BC to 30 BC, so basically 14 years. His father was Julius Caesar who was messing around with Cleopatra until her death. After she died, he was 17 years old until the Romans invaded and conquered Egypt that same year. Now, if they were in Egypt, why was his name Ptolemy? That's European. And you would be right. Ptolemy the Fifteenth, as well as Cleopatra, in fact the whole Ptolemaic dynasty, were Macedonians with white skin. Number eight is, oh, this is a hard one to say, Rorik. One of the first main types of historical figures that everyone knows about are the founders of countries. For example, George Washington founded the United States, eh, kinda. Julius Caesar founded the Roman Empire, you know what I'm talking about. But one that eludes the public for some reason is Rorik. He isn't the founder of some unknown country, he founded Russia. He was the founder of the Rorikid dynasty, god that's hard to say, and said dynasty also spawned Daniel I of Moscow, the first Grand Duke of the city. That whole thing is a long story, just know that Rorik had blood and future ancestral ties to the founding of Russia. Anyways, Rorik was a Varangian, a branch of Vikings, just more Slavic in nature. Rorik was a pretty bad dude and had a posse of some pretty bad boys and, you know, in general was pretty sick. Not like ill, just, you know, cool dude. He was born in the year 830, and throughout his life, he captained the Rus people to victory throughout Western Russia and Eastern Europe, eventually becoming the future leader of Russia, you know, a few centuries down the line, but, you know. Number 7 is Arthur Wellesley. If you're from the British Isles, prepare for some patriotism candy. So if you've ever heard of the Duke of Wellington, this would be him. This guy's got some British muscle to pick with the French. Bubba bubba breakdown, okie doker, so who is he? Arthur was born in 1769 and grew up poor, so he joined the foot regiments, and I have no idea on God's green earth what those are. He spent a long time in British-controlled India, fighting the various Indian kingdoms that rebelled and rose up through the ranks. In 1802, he had already become a major general. He went back to Europe for a while and was now high and mighty within the British military. However, the most important events of his life were still coming up. 
It was against Napoleon, and if you know history, you know the British and the French have a turbo-mega-giga hyper-rivalry. Napoleon was invading Spain and Portugal, and in 1808, Arthur crushingly defeated Napoleon's army there. After many years of fighting, the British and a few allies won the Peninsular War in Spain and Portugal. He was also sent to attack the U.S. in the War of 1812, when Britain went to war with the U.S. and wrestled us up a bit. In the midst of another Europe-wide war, however, Arthur refused to attack America and told the Prime Minister that he, quote, had no right to demand territory from America, end quote, because they couldn't even capture the enemy's territory in Europe. What an absolute friggin' baller. In 1815, in the Battle of Waterloo, some of the best British generals were sent to fight the French along with some other allies and enemies. The battle is extremely long, but very important, and just know that our boy Arthur won. He saved Britain and, more widely, Europe from Napoleon's control and later became Prime Minister himself. This dude is so important to both European and all of military history, and yet hardly anyone outside of Western Europe know who he is. It's criminal, I tell ya. Number six is, uh, Ignacy Moschitsky. I'm just gonna call him Ignacy, it's easier to say. So I legitimately don't know why this cat isn't known very well, he played a real get him good role in history that wasn't super long ago, it was just World War II after all. So who is our friend Ignacy? Well, put simply, he was the president of Poland right before the Nazis invaded. I'm not including him because his role was particularly powerful in the war, but because the invasion of Poland is often marked as the real turning point in the war, when the Allies began to teach Germany a lesson or two, and for some reason we know everyone else's name in the war, but not Poland's. Like, America's president was FDR, Britain's was Churchill, the Soviets had Stalin, and so on, but we just skip over Poland's guy, even though his country's invasion was what started the entire war. I don't know why. After Poland got invaded, he was exiled to all sorts of places like Romania and the US and others, and resumed his work as a chemist. He lived for about a year after the war when he died in 1946. His memory still lives on pretty positively for Poland. So five is, uh, Jan Hus. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Alright, so there's just no excuse for this one. Jan Hus was a Czech theologian from the early 1400s, and I know that's not saying much, but just hear me out here. So Jan was born in 1372 in Bohemia, which is now Czechia. On his 18th birthday, roundabout at least, he went to the University of Prague and began to study vigorously. A few years later, he graduated with a high degree and began to teach there at the university. After some years of promotion and rising in the ranks of the university, his actions began to be noticed by the church itself. Hus was a staunch supporter of John Wycliffe, a Protestant English philosopher. The church began to ban many of Wycliffe's teachings and books. Subsequently, Hus was like, oh no, my hero, and carried on his legacy by teaching and translating Wycliffe's teachings and distributing them. Hus was very anti-Catholic and rejected the Pope and bishops and all that jazz. By now, Hus's teachings were spreading all over Bohemia, so the church was like, "Oh heck, Protestant wildfire, and countered it by banning all his stuff, burning all of his writings, and his followers be given the boot. He was dreadfully excommunicated in 1411, and that's when stuff really fell apart. See, at the time, the church and Protestants really hated each other. Now they're cool with each other, but at the time, boy was there a rivalry. So any suspected Protestants who went too far were given a coupon on being alive, if you get where I'm going with that. The Council of Constance caught wind of this cat, so this marked the beginning of the end for old Johnny Boy. In June of 1415, Yan was sent to a monastery to live out the last itty bitty bits of his life. They decided to execute him on July 6th, 1415, where he was burned at the stake. Understandably, his supporters weren't too happy about this, so they revolted in this huge religious revolution called the Hussite Wars. Yan's teachings were also an inspiration for Martin Luther in the 1500s, which went on to cause the Protestant Reformation, 
which is extremely important in history. If you're not that well versed in history, it changes the course of European history forever, and without Jan Hus, Europe wouldn't be the same as it is now. So number four is Pol Pot. So here's another monstrous dictator that has somehow slipped public knowledge. Pol Pot, real name Saloth Tsar, was the communist dictator of Cambodia from 1975 to 1979. This is a heads up, uh, this one might not be as goofball-y as some of the others. Uh, so he was the head of the uber-communist Khmer Rouge regime, and was also a Cambodian nationalist. You can already see where this is going. I'm gonna skip the first few decades of his life because it really doesn't pertain to this, so we're gonna skip to when he gets extremist. Cut to mid-1950s Cambodia. They just became independent from France, and they're really in some turmoil. Naturally, Saloth, as well as many others, took to the Communist Party. Remember that in a struggling, war-torn country, an ideology like communism looks really appealing because it promises strength among unity, and every worker is equal. It was amidst a civil war, so yeah. He began to rise through the ranks of the party, and in 1962 became its leader. As things got more and more extreme, the Khmer Rouge was formed in the jungle, literally. At first, it was only wily teens who were looking for some PG-13 young adult adventures, but soon it gained popularity. Pol Pot began to become very popular among the people. Finally, in 1975, he and his supporters took control of Phnom Penh, Cambodia's capital, and carried on the legacy of Mao Zedong, Hero to some, enemy to... 45 million. Oh. Now commandeering the new brutal rule over the country, he began his slaughter. The educated and elites were killed, and so was anyone wearing glasses, which suggested that they could read or had money. Anyone too educated was also killed. People were severely overworked as normal city dwellers were relocated to the rice fields. Disease and hunger were rampant. They made all religions strictly illegal, and teenagers were forced to make bombs and mines. Parties were now illegal, not like political parties, just gatherings in general, and marital eugenics were in place. After four years of this brutal mass torture of the people, communist Vietnamese forces from next door invaded Cambodia and seized the capital, ending Pol Pot's reign. The Khmer Rouge faded from power and in the early 1990s completely disbanded. Pol Pot died in 1998 and his ashes were scattered. 30% of everyone in Cambodia died because of his rule. Number 3 is Matthew Ridgway. Ridgway was a general in the US Army during World War II and the Korean War. He was one of the US's highest ranking generals, yet he's relatively unknown to most people even within the US. He was born in 1895 in Virginia. Because his father Thomas was also high in the army, Ridgway's childhood was mostly moving around different army bases and doing army drills. Eventually, he went to West Point and in 1917 became a second lieutenant. I don't know what that means in terms of the army, but nonetheless is impressive to me. During World War I, he was stationed along the border with Mexico, sweating putty balls. Always piecemeal militarization until Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Suddenly, Ridgway found himself being rapidly promoted, starting close to the bottom and literally to Major General in only four and a half months. Throughout the war, he would lead different divisions until 1943 during the perilous invasion of Sicily. When the Allies were invading Normandy in 1944, Ridgway was one of the generals at the helm there, as well as dropping troops via air into the Benelux region. After being quite distinguished after the war, he was almost immediately wrapped up into the Korean War as well soon after, where he valiantly helped the South Koreans and fought the invading Communist Chinese forces from the north. In 1952, he passed even the likes of Eisenhower. By 1955, however, he retired and became an author. That same year, he moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and lived out the rest of his life there. He was awarded the Medal of Freedom in 1986 by President Ronald Reagan, good American that he is. He died in 1993 at the age of 98 from cardiac arrest. 
If you want to laugh, look at some of Ridgeway's nicknames. So number two is Constantine the Eleventh. You've often heard of Roman emperors over the years. Julius Caesar, Justinian, Hadrian, Speve. The first leader of anything Roman was Romulus, of who the city was named after in 753 BC, but who was the last Roman leader? Past the Roman kings and emperors and all of that, well, turns out it's him, Constantine XI. I'll explain in a bit. Born in 1404 in Constantinople, at this time, the Byzantine Empire went from a mighty empire that spanned half of Europe to only a few tiny blots along the coast of Greece and the Peloponnesus and the western half of Constantinople. Most of his youth was spent armchair governing smaller, less important regions of the empire, if you can call it that. His brother died childless, which meant that in 1449, he ascended to the throne. Constantine XI devoted nearly all of his time as emperor on protecting Constantinople from the ensuing threat of the Ottomans. In th eventually, in 1453, the Ottomans broke through and Constantinople fell. The Byzantine soldiers in the area, in a final stand, fearlessly devoted their lives as best they could to protect the city. Constantine XI actually fought and died in the battle, defending his city. He died at the age of 48, watching his beloved city fall to the enemy. After 2,206 years, Roman influence in Europe ended. Sorta? That's a future video. If Romulus founded Rome, Constantine XI ended it. This one has similarities to our number 9 boy, Ptolemy. And finally, number 1 is Timur. Timur, also known as Tamerlane, is an important figure who I really don't know why he isn't more well known. He was born in 1336, near modern-day Uzbekistan, and he was a big fan of the Mongols. In 1357, Timur became loyal to the Khan, or leader, of Kashgar, a kingdom nearby. Soon, Timur now had a minor position in the Khanate's government. Basically dissatisfied, Timur called BS and skedaddled, joining his brother-in-law's Khanate, and together they conquered his old Khanate in 1366. Now that they were expanding, Timur saw an opportunity and turned on his brother-in-law and defeated him. Now this is where he sort of got a Napoleon complex and began to call himself the new Mongol Emperor, and that he would bring back it and stuff like that. It, it's, it's pretty crazy. I mean, he basically had a decently sized empire, but still. For over a decade, Timur will go on to defeat more and more Khanates in the area, absorbing them into his empire. He also allied with the Khan of Crimea, which at the time was still Turkic, not Ukrainian. In 1383, Timur began to battle his way through Persia and breezed through the Caucasus, even managing to defeat Georgia, a rare feat. His empire became pretty threatening and, for a bit, looked like it might actually become the new Mongol Empire. However, in the 1380s, the late half, Timur met his match when the Golden Horde, a pretty large empire in, in western Eurasia, defeated the Timurids. Over the years, Timur went on to do more bizarre stuff, like building towers out of human skulls, used elephants to build mosques, and slaughter everyone in whatever town rebelled. Throughout the early 1400s, marched through the Middle East and Levant, plundering cities and taking Ottoman lands. Even the Byzantines got spooked as they encroached closer. Timur died of an illness in 1405 and was buried in a tomb in Samarkand, Uzbekistan. I included him in there because he is a, like the Hong Kong of historical figures to me. In the same vein that Hong Kong should be a country in every sense but isn't, Timur should absolutely be remembered for some reason, but goes ignored. Why? So, that was quite the adventure, wasn't it? I'm sure all of my history buffs watching were groaning at the list, but you would really be surprised at how many people don't know these. These people are significant historical figures, yet we're all okay with not knowing them. And no, it's not an American thing, these people are globally unknown unless you're from their main countries. Like, I'm sure someone from Uzbekistan would probably know Timur a lot better than someone from the US, but someone from the US would know Ridgeway more than Timur. Everything is inverse, I see.